Welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. But the more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. Diamond is an impressive material, I suppose. It's visually striking due to its transparency and high refractive index, and it is one of the hardest substances in the world. But to me, as a material scientist, it just isn't that interesting. Its rarity is exaggerated, and its high price is more of a consequence of market manipulation by companies like De Beers, rather than real demand or value. High quality synthetic versions can be made easily in the lab. Diamonds sparkle and have a few niche applications, but besides that, they aren't very useful. And they are not forever. Diamonds will burn like toilet paper in an oxygen-rich environment. Thermodynamically speaking, diamond is only metastable, meaning diamonds are slowly transforming, decaying back into lumps of graphite. They aren't the most precious gemstones. If someone were getting down on one knee and proposing to me, I would be much more likely to say yes to a ring with an alexandrite gem rather than a diamond. They're rarer, more expensive, and can actually change color from green to blue when you turn them in the right light. That would impress me. Muscrophite is another one, more precious than diamond, with a pretty gray color. If you really want the best of the best, boron-based painite is the rarest gem, with less than a thousand specimens on Earth, and only a handful of decent quality. And diamond isn't even the rarest form of carbon. There is a super rare, even harder form of diamond found only in meteorites, called Lonstalite. Diamonds get all the attention, but there are even more exotic and interesting forms of just plain carbon. There are nano sheets of graphene, just one atom thick that I discussed in a previous episode. There are nanotubes, Buckminster fullerenes, and even carbon pea pods, or fullerenes, stuck inside nanotubes. Of all the elements, carbon may be the most complex and versatile. Antoine Lavoisier named the element carbon in 1789 from the Latin word carbo, meaning charcoal. He was an interesting person. Lavoisier was a French nobleman who started what is sometimes called the chemical revolution. This was the early modern reformation of the core ideas of chemistry, primarily the law of conservation of mass and the oxygen-based theory of combustion. Some refer to Lavoisier as the father of modern chemistry. While he was starting the chemical revolution, he was also taking part in the French Revolution. At the height of the war, he was charged by the French government with tax fraud and selling counterfeit tobacco. Lavoisier was actually executed, guillotined, at the age of 50. The element he named, carbon, is the 15th most abundant element in the Earth's crust and the fourth most abundant element in the universe in terms of mass, after hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. Carbon's abundance and its unusual ability to form polymers at the moderate temperatures on Earth enable it to serve as the common element to all known life. Carbon remains a solid at temperatures higher than any other known material. It doesn't start to vaporize or sublime from its solid form until over 5,500 degrees Celsius or nearly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It stands up to heat better than the highest melting metals like tungsten or rhenium. It even resists oxidation more effectively than iron and copper. What makes carbon so special is the way it chemically bonds to itself and other elements in the periodic table. The electrons spinning around the carbon nucleus do something peculiar. Their wave functions overlap and blur into one another or hybridize. This leads to electrons sharing each other's space and to very strong and very directional chemical bonds. Chemist, Vitamin C evangelist and hero of the show, Linus Pauling, first developed the hybridization theory in 1931 to explain the structure of methane, CH4. Pauling pointed out that a carbon atom forms four bonds by using 1s and 3p orbitals. Carbon is an important element for me personally. The first atoms I ever saw myself with my own eyes in the lab were carbon on a graphite surface through a scanning tunneling microscope. Lonstalite, or hexagonal diamonds, are the rarest form of carbon. They can only be found naturally in meteorites. The crystal is named after Kathleen Lonsdale. She was a British pacifist 
prison reformer and crystallographer. She proved in 1929 that the benzene ring is flat. She also proposed that an exotic, hexagonal form of diamond could exist, given unimaginable conditions of temperature and pressure. Years later, she was proven right. Lonstolite was discovered and identified in 1967 in the Canyon Diablo meteorite. It's translucent, brownish-yellow, and has a similar sparkle to a common diamond. Hexagonal diamond's hardness is theoretically superior to that of cubic diamond, up to 58% higher. This means that a crystal of lonstolite could actually scratch a diamond. The trouble is, natural specimens tend not to quite measure up to that, exhibiting somewhat lower hardness. It's probably because the meteorite samples are riddled with crystal lattice defects, damage, and impurities. In addition to meteorite deposits, hexagonal diamond has been synthesized in a laboratory by compressing and heating graphite either in a static press or by using explosives. That sounds like my kind of lab. If you were to take hexagonal diamond and flatten it out, you would arrive at one of the newest curiosities in the material science world. Graphene is a two-dimensional sheet of carbon with the atoms arranged in a hexagonal lattice. According to many researchers, it appears to be the strongest material ever characterized by science. Imagine taking a sheet of graphene and rolling it into a tube. The identity of who discovered carbon nanotubes is a matter of some controversy. Most academic and popular literature attribute the discovery of the hollow, nanometer-sized tubes composed of graphitic carbon to Sumio Ajima of the NEC Corporation in 1991. His paper created a flurry of excitement and inspired many scientists to study carbon nanotubes. Though Ijima has been given credit for the discovery, it turns out that the timeline goes back much earlier than 1991. In 1952, researchers L. V. Radushkovich and V. M. Lukyanovich published clear images of 50 nanometer diameter carbon tubes in the Journal of Physical Chemistry of Russia. This discovery went largely unnoticed because the article was published only in Russian, and Western scientists' access to the Soviet press was very limited during the Cold War. Carbon nanotubes are like graphene, a fairly recent discovery, and a very strong and potentially very useful material. They can come in a variety of lengths, widths, and forms. They can be single or multi-walled. Nanotubes have found their way into experimental body armor, high-strength textiles, high temperature and chemical resistant filters. Some carbon nanotubes can conduct electricity and have even been spun into working USB power cables. Researchers from Rice University have shown that just a dash of carbon nanotubes can lead to significant improvements in the mechanical properties of plastic nanocomposites for tissue engineering and bone grafting. Nanotubes have a sufficient strength to weight ratio that they could enable something as grand and revolutionary as a space elevator. They're not difficult to make. Ordinary soot from a burning candle contains a few carbon nanotubes. The structure of carbon nano scrolls is similar to that of multi-wall carbon nanotubes, but with a spiral-like rolled up geometry with open edges at the ends. These are so new and exotic that no one has yet come up with a good use. The Buckminster Fullerene is a form of pure carbon with the chemical formula C60. It has a cage-like structure, or truncated icosahedron. It resembles a football or soccer ball with 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. Theoretical predictions of buckyball molecules appeared in the late 1960s and early 70s, but these reports didn't get much attention. Buckminster fullerenes were first generated in 1984 by Eric Rothling, Donald Cox, and Andrew Caldor using a laser to vaporize carbon in a supersonic helium beam. In 1985, their work was repeated and validated by Harold Croto, James Heath, Sean O'Brien, Robert Curl, and Richard Smalley at Rice University. They recognized the structure of C60 as the Buckminster fullerene. An experiment in 2011 administered a solution of C60 fullerenes in olive oil to rats, achieving a major extension of their lifespan. Diamond nanoparticles, or nanodiamonds, are diamonds with a size smaller than one micron 
or 1,000 nanometers. They are produced by massively energetic events, such as explosions or meteorite impacts. Other than explosions, preparation methods include hydrothermal synthesis, ion and laser bombardment, and chemical vapor deposition techniques. However, detonation synthesis has become the industry standard in the commercial production of nanodiamonds. Detonation is often performed in sealed stainless steel chambers, yielding a mixture of nanodiamonds, nanotubes, and other graphitic compounds. Carbon quantum dots, or CQDs, are small carbon nanoparticles, less than 10 nanometers in size, with some form of surface passivation or shell covering. CQDs were first discovered in 2004 accidentally during the purification of carbon nanotubes. Carbon dots possess desirable properties like high stability, low toxicity, and environmental sustainability. They have been extensively investigated by researchers because of their strong and tunable fluorescence and other optical effects. Carbon nanofoam is an allotrope of carbon discovered in 1997 by Andre Rode and his team at the Australian National University of Canberra. It's composed of a clustered assembly of carbon atoms, strung together in a loose three-dimensional web. The fractal structure consists of sp2-bonded, graphite-like clusters, connected by sp3 diamond-like bonds. This material is remarkably light, with a density similar to silica aerogel. Carbon nanofoam is the only pure form of carbon known to be ferromagnetic. Why this happens is still a mystery. This magnetic effect seems to be an intrinsic property of the carbon nanofoam. Impurities in the material have been ruled out as the cause, and experiments suggest it's likely due to the complex fractal foam structure itself. Take just a single common element like carbon. Structure it in a different way, and amazing things can happen. Charcoal can be ferromagnetic, like iron. That's alchemy, and it's real. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.